couldn't live on fish alone, they made a welcome addition to the diet. That's looking good. Looking good. During the war, the saboteurs had to do this by swimming the nets out, didn't they? If they didn't have a boat, which they didn't have many times, they would have to swim it out, yes. Or pull it with a, with a string across some narrow yeah. somewhere. The longer the nets stay in the water, the better your chances of a good haul. I'm happy to leave them in for most of the day while I explore more of the Hardanger's summer secrets. This hut was built by another group of partisans. Originally it stood high up on the plateau, beyond the reach of the Germans, but now it's been moved lower down as a museum piece, showing how the saboteurs used to live. At first glance this might look just like a normal mountain hut from the 1940s, but when you look more carefully you can actually find evidence of resistance. This stall, for example, is not quite what it appears to be. It's actually made from a drop canister, Thousands of these were dropped into Norway during the Second World War, containing everything from food to munitions. To stop things breaking when they landed, the items inside were very heavily padded, and this bunk has been insulated with exactly that packing material. And there's more evidence of parachute drops here. The seat is upholstered with parachute canopy material. Incredible. Every few weeks, the saboteurs would meet informants from the factory to find out how close the Germans were to restarting production. But most of the time, they stayed high on the plateau to avoid compromising their contacts. So for clothing, food and equipment, they came to rely on those drops made by the Royal Air Force. In all, they dropped nearly 700 containers and packages in this one corner of Norway, just to keep Haukeli and his men supplied and some haven't moved from the places where they fell. It's amazing to think that these canisters have been sitting here for over 60 years. What's really surprising is if I try to lift it, I can barely get it off the ground. And the reason for that is it's still full. And if you're wondering what's inside, come and have a look at this. more canisters, so these ones are broken open. And there is an arms cache. These are 303 rounds for a Lienfield. They're dated 1942. For people living such an isolated existence, these drops and the risks taken by the RAF to provide them must have reminded them that they were a crucial part of a far larger war effort. But most of the time, they were left to their own devices relying on their outdoor skills to stay alive. You got it? Yep. Yep, I move around. The nets have been in all day, yep, and my it. patience is about to be rewarded. Yeah. Hey, this is good. This is good fishing. Good fishing today. Another one yet? Yeah. What do you reckon? The saboteurs would simply have fried or boiled their fish, but I want to show Knut something a bit more ambitious. First the garnish, fresh sorrel leaves, and the starchy edible roots of a plant called alpine bistort. And if I break that in half, you can see that it's white inside. It's got carbohydrate in it, which means energy. And uh, although it's very small, no, it's not bad. There are lots of them. Then a handful of cotton grass, not to eat, but to get my fire lit. The preparation couldn't be simpler. The trout fillets are prized off the bone and stuffed with sorrel for extra flavour. So I've got 
very hot there. Those rocks have been heated up by that fire now for 40 minutes or so. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a layer of moss in there, then the fish, and then more moss for insulation. We've got a few bits of the old alpine bistort. They can go in there as well. It'll take about 45 minutes for the fish to steam, so while they're cooking, I'm going to flash fry another one on a simple hot rock. This is the kind of thing you'd pay a fortune for in a restaurant, but it couldn't be more straightforward. If you're in the mountains and you haven't got a cooking pot with you, this is an extremely good way of cooking meat. One of the great advantages is you don't use very much firewood. The firewood heats up the rock, which holds the heat for a long while, giving you a nice, steady, even cooking. How'd you like your fish, Knip? Like this, I think. It's about to be done. Yeah. Delicious. Oh, good. You don't have to lie. What do you really think? <laughs> I mean it. <laughs> Got some more. <laughs> well, shall we give this a go? Okay. Let's see what we make of that then. Mmm. Oh, that looks good, doesn't it? Oh. oh. Perfect. That's the Alpine Bistort. Mm. Let's see what you make of that. There you go. One for you. One for me. Yeah. A bit potato-ish. Yeah. On this perfect evening, it's as if the years have been rolled back. When the saboteurs enjoyed sunsets like this, it must have been hard for them to imagine the fury that raged in Norway and further afield. But just six months after the original raid, Knut Haukli heard from a contact that the plant was up and running again, producing more heavy water for the German atomic research effort. He radioed the information back to Britain. Almost at once, SOE ruled out a second commando raid as being too risky. The stepping up of the German uh, uh, defences and the like meant that this was really uh, not an option that, that SOE or combined operations felt was practicable. Uh, and with great reluctance it was decided to, to bomb the plant. This had been discounted before because of the possibility of civilian casualties but the Americans had felt cut out of the sabotage operation and wanted to take the upper hand. November the 15th, 1943. The plan was for the bombing raid to happen between 11.30 and 11.45, when workers at the plant were on a break in the basement bunker. The raid involved 174 US planes dropping over 800 bombs on Vermont. Although much of the machinery at the plant was damaged, 22 civilians were killed, and crucially, the bombs missed the new stockpile of heavy water. Haukley reported this news back to London, knowing that he would have to find a new opportunity to destroy the stocks. As autumn on the plateau turned to winter again, that opportunity presented itself. The bombing raid had persuaded the Germans that their stocks of heavy water were not safe in Norway. They planned to take the remaining supplies to Germany. This would be the saboteurs' last chance to destroy the stocks, but they would need help. How could he turn to a trusted member of the local resistance cell? Today, Knut Lier Hansen is the only surviving witness to this final operation. We knew there was 600 kilo of heavy water into railway wagons and we discussed at length where to stop it. We could blow up the railway line between Weimark and Rukan and that would push the wagons into the gorge. But the Germans would still have the tanks with the heavy water. Vermork's unique geography provided the answer. From the foot of the valley, the tankers would be carried across a lake by ferry before being taken on by rail to the open sea. This ferry crossing would be the weakest link. If the saboteurs